Well, good to see everybody here tonight, and uh, hope you had a good day, and are ready to study together. And in just a few minutes, we'll have our invitation song, Come to Jesus. So last Sunday on the way out, I got four questions out the door. Today I didn't get any. So either I did an okay job or nobody was paying attention. So do we have any questions from this morning's lesson? On anything? I don't necessarily have a question. I like the way that, that you tie what Paul was doing before, before he knew what the church was and who the church was. And the way that you tied that into what Jesus said to him when was on the road to Damascus. Mm. Yep. Yes. So what Brother Randy was saying was the connection in Acts 8 and verse 3, Saul making havoc of the church, with Acts 9 and verse 4, where when Jesus appeared to Saul, he said, why are you persecuting me? And just making that connection of what we think of the church and how we treat the church and, and all of that is... The, we do the same thing to Christ. What we do to the church, what we say about the church, it's about Him too because it's His body. And that's the thing. You know, and Paul talks about that in various other places. Uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, Romans chapter 12, those two chapters. Ephesians chapter 4, he talks about the body. Uh, you, and I, I mentioned it this morning in the lesson, you cannot separate the head from the body. So we're studying on Wednesday nights or rather Sunday mornings about the apostles. And a few of them were beheaded. Well, what happens when you cut the head off of a body? It dies. If you try to have the... And it's kind of like that same sentiment that a lot of people in the world have. They want, they want a relationship with God, or they want a relationship with Jesus, but they don't want to go to church. A lot of people despise what they call organized religion. Well... You cannot have a relationship with God. You cannot have a relationship with Christ if you are not in His body. It is not possible. The Bible talks about people... <clears throat> so there are two classes of people. There's the saved and there's the lost, period. But the way the Bible frames it in um, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12, Paul's talking to the Ephesians about before they were converted. He said, at that time you were without Christ... So the two classes of people then that we could look at in that sense, people who have reached the, the age of accountability where they can learn the gospel and hear it and obey it, you've got those who are in Christ and those who are out, outside of Christ. There's no middle ground there. You're either in Him or you're not. So how we treat the church, and, and you know, I even mentioned that a little bit this morning. You know, I think a lot of times those of us who have grown up with it, as we say, who, who were brought up going to church, we, I think sometimes there's a danger for us in taking it for granted because it's just always been there. You know, it's always been a part of our lives. And then we see someone, this has been my experience, you see someone come into Christ, hear the gospel, obey it from whatever background. And it's like they take it a lot more seriously than we do who grew up in it. I think that's a danger of... Uh, of not appreciating what we have in Christ and who we are in Christ. So that, that connection there in Acts 8.3 and Acts 9.4 is not insignificant. It teaches us, I think, a lot about Christ's view of our view of His body, which is the church. Do you have a question? Yeah. It, <laughs> well, going to church as you grew up, whatever. As far as the organized religion, uh, there's too many of them out there that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I've, I've touched on that throughout this series of lessons. Um, 
That's why we're going through the book of Acts, because the book of Acts is the historical account of the establishment and growth of the church of Christ from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then to the uttermost part of the earth. That's what Acts is all about. And we can model that today because we have that book of history that shows us precisely what that looks like. So, uh, can't ever take that for granted. Anybody else have a question from this morning's lesson? Okay. So, we, I told you, of course, last week we couldn't get into it because we had too many questions, but we're going we're gonna to do a study of the life of Solomon. So, hopefully you picked up an outline. If not, you can get one on the way out. They're in those little bins. Uh, so, let's start. Take your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 12, and we'll start there. The life of Solomon. And this is ultimately going to lead us into a study of the book of Ecclesiastes. Of course, 2 Samuel chapter, chapters 11 and 12 are the account of David and Bathsheba and the child that was born to that fornication and then ultimately died. But then later in 2 Samuel chapter 12, if you get down to verses uh, 24 and 25, it says, And David comforted Bathsheba his wife, and went, into her, went in unto her, and lay with her, and she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. And that's what Solomon means, beloved of the Lord. Uh, and then verse uh, 25, And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah, because of the Lord. So, Solomon, a.k.a. Jedediah, he is the 10th son. And I don't think this is insignificant either, either. Watching the life of Solomon progress from here, especially though into his uh, reign as king, this is not insignificant either. He's the 10th son of David. So I'm going I'm to flip my Bible over real quick to first, what is it? First Chronicles chapter 3. You know, we hear that statement, like father, like son. Well, Solomon is the tenth son by David's seventh wife. So just, you know, let that soak in for a minute. His tenth son by his seventh wife. Of course, we know that we know the, the story of Solomon, I, I would say in general. So let's go ahead and go to 1 Kings chapter 2. You know, God granted Solomon this wisdom. His prayer came to God. Uh, I'm like a child. I've got this great nation to judge, and I don't know what to do. I'm like a child who doesn't know how to, to come in or go out. And, you know, he asked for wisdom to be able to judge among so great a population, of course, God granted him with that, but then also granted him with, with wealth, with riches above anybody and everybody. And you wonder, with all of that wisdom that God enabled him to have, why in the world did he go off track? And I can't help but make the connection with his dad. His tenth son by his seventh wife. Anyway... We're in 1 Kings chapter 2. So 1 Kings, the, the end of 2 Samuel, the first chapter or two of 1 Kings set the stage for Solomon taking the throne. David is right near the end of his life, and uh, he's got, obviously, a bunch of children. 1 Kings chapter 1 records one of his sons by the name of Adonijah. Um, Adonijah presumes the throne, yet it's already been prophesied that Solomon would be king. Adonijah is David's, I didn't, I, I didn't even keep count of this one, but he's one of David's sons by a separate wife, Haggith. So Adonijah and Solomon are half-brothers, I guess we'd say. But right before his death, David talks to Solomon. And I've thought about this, you know, what, so growing up from a Christian perspective, if you had an opportunity like David had, and you had a last few days or hours or whatever of coherent existence right before you died, what would you tell your kids? Work as hard as you can and make as much money as you can. You know, I would hope not. 
Um, be as successful in life as you can be. I would hope not. I hope that's not your, that's not our perspective on the world. That life, that the goal of life is to have a fat bank account and be happy, because that stuff can be gone in a matter of minutes. That stuff can be wiped out. Sometimes with things beyond our control. So, let's look here in First Kings two, beginning in verse one. It says, "Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die." And he charged Solomon, his son, saying, and the word charged here, it's the idea of a solemn, uh, very serious matter being communicated here. I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his ju uh, commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses. And here's the purpose for that. That thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. <clears throat> that the Lord, verse 4, that the Lord may continue his word, which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to, the, uh, to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. So that's... Some of David's last words. And, you know, again, from a Christian perspective, having children myself and you guys, you know, those of you who are bringing up children, that's pretty solid advice, isn't it? That, that's because you think about it. People talk about uh, the last words of their love and they'll never forget what their loved one said to them at the very end. It's something they cherish for the rest of their life. Well, it's quite good advice for. Uh, for us, I would say as Christians, pay attention to the word of God, do what he said, that you may prosper. Now, prosper, again, doesn't necessarily mean having uh, financial success and things like that, or always being happy, uh, because, again, that's not reality. The, the concept that, that life is about finding something that makes you happy is, is very uh, short-sighted. We're not called to be happy. That's not, that's not the goal of life. That's, there, there's nothing wrong with being happy. In fact, you know, Peter talks about this in 1 Peter chapter 3. He who would love life and see good days. And then he enumerates a few things. 1 Peter 3 verses 10 through 12. Let him do this and this and this. But in that same book where Peter talks about seeing good days and loving life, he talks about the fiery trial which is to try you. And the persecution that's coming upon you. So... When you look at this advice here in verses 3 and 4, um, there's no better advice than this. So he goes on for, well, if you've got your outline, I've jumped down to the bottom here. So number one, obey God. That's, that's your primary, should be your primary goal in life. His second charge, take care of Joab. Uh, Joab is one of David's, uh, what's called men of valor. One of his warriors, the captain of his army, in fact. But Joab was not a good individual. He was completely devoted to David. But he was not a good person. Um, look, let's see what, okay, listen to this. Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me, and what he did to the two captains of the hosts of Israel, unto Abner, the son of Ner, and unto Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he slew, and shed the blood of war in time of peace. So he seems like a guy of revenge. Uh, and put the blood of war upon his girdle that he was about that was about his loins, and in his shoes that were on his feet. Do therefore according to thy wisdom, and let not his uh, let not his whore head. That's a King James phrase. His gray hair go down to the grave in peace. So Solomon takes care of that. Um, if, you, if you're making notes, he killed Abner. That's recorded in 2, King, uh, 2 Samuel 3. And he killed Amasa. That's recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 20. But if also, if you look at 2 Samuel, what is it? Chapter 19, I believe it is. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 18, he killed Absalom, David's son. And David specifically said... Don't do that. Well, so Joab, is, Joab, while devoted to David and David's cause, was not a good man. Solomon does that. 
Thirdly, show kindness to Barzillai. And that's 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 7, uh, where that commandment is given. He says, uh, For they came to me when I fled because of Absalom thy brother. Absalom revolted, and this is one of the men who came to David's aid and helped him out. That's recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 17. And then David instructs Solomon, fourthly, to kill Shimei. And Shimei, this is 2 Samuel 16, when Solomon revolted, or rather when, when Absalom revolted against David, as David was fleeing Jerusalem, Shimei was following along, throwing rocks at him and cursing him and stuff like this. And so David didn't lay his hand on him, but he tells Solomon to kill him. So he's the tenth son of David by, his, by David's seventh wife. He becomes the third king of the United Kingdom of Israel. Look at verse, so, uh, first Samuel, I'm sorry, first Kings 2 and verse 12. Then Solomon sat upon the throne of David his father, and the kingdom was established greatly. If you want to look at the summation of Solomon's life, read 1 Kings 1 through 11. That pretty much covers it all. But it's also recorded in 2 Chronicles as well. <clears throat> he reigned for 40 years. Uh, that's revealed in 1 Kings eleven forty two, And the date is approximately 970 to 930 B.C. And that, so the, the time of the, what's called the United Kingdom of Israel is about 120 years. Saul, David, and Solomon reigned for 40 years apiece. And uh, this is the, more so during the days of Solomon, what's called the Golden Age of Israel. Silver was counted as nothing in his days. Everything was made of gold or overlaid in gold. And uh, it would have been quite something to see. I found these quotes, and I thought they were interesting, that I'd share them with you. Quotes about Solomon to help us get a frame of reference. His everyday sensuality made him, in the end, a castaway. And one person said that he seemed to rule more for his own aggrandizement and not for the welfare of the people. We have no record of Solomon's repentance. And that's interesting because a lot of people go to the book of Ecclesiastes where, remember that book ends, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. Well, that's all true. But there's no record of his repentance in Scripture. And also think about this. Hebrews chapter 11, the, what we call the hall of faith. You've got, you know, you've got uh, Abel, Noah, Abraham, Moses. You've got all these people, even David. And, and even Samson is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Guess who's not there? Solomon. So uh, we have no record of his repentance. We have his remorse. One person said this. We have his remorse, his discontent, his disgust, and his self-contempt. And that's the book of Ecclesiastes, which again, this, this study is leading into that direction of the study of Ecclesiastes. His wisdom did not teach him self-control. Um, so let's do this just real quick. Take your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And I pointed this out to you before. I'll just do it again real quick. There are, there are a couple of key words or key phrases in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, vanity, the term vanity is used 36 times in 12 chapters. And if you can do math, that's, that's an average of three times per chapter. And that's quite a bit. In such a short book, Ecclesiastes is only 222 verses long, but... 36 times he says, it's all vanity. It's all, um, essentially, it's all a waste. Uh, and then the King James also, uh, how does it say it? Uh, vanity of vanities, all is vanities. And it, then he says, it's vexation of spirit. I prefer the New King James there. It says, it's grasping for the wind. It's a waste of time. It's like trying to grab hold of the wind. He says that uh, nine times in the 12 chapters. So... The way the book begins, laying out his, Solomon's pursuit in life, look at chapter 2. I said in mine heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, that's pleasure, therefore enjoy it, that's vanity. I said of laughter, it is madness, you know, there's no ultimate benefit to being entertained all the time, that's his conclusion. 
I sought, mine heart, I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine. Well, I'll drink to make myself happy. Well, that's vanity. I made great works. He was a workaholic. Then look at chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. I had gardens, orchards, trees, fruits, pools of water. Um, to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I had all kinds of servants. I had singers. I mean, the guy had everything you could imagine. And then, you know, plenty of money left over. And his conclusion in the whole book is it's all vanity. It's all trying to grab a hold of the wind. You can't do it. And so, uh, looking at these quotes, again, if you have your outline, I think these, three, four, these five bullet points here sum up well his life. Um, and it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to figure how someone with, who is blessed with so much ability, with so much wisdom, would just throw his life away. And that's what he did. But it was all in the pursuit of pleasure. It was all in the pursuit of what can fulfill my life. Well, again, you look at those things, pleasure, entertainment, alcohol, work, servants, singers. It's, it's a waste of time. That's what the word vanity means. There's nothing in life like that that will give you meaning, that will give you purpose. And so that's his conclusion at the end of the book. Fear God and keep his commandments for that is the, the, the all of man. Uh, some versions say there in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, for that is man's all. Uh, the King James says, for that is the whole duty of man. Well, that's what life is all about to him since he lived the, the, the vain way that he did live. Uh, all right, let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 1. I, I don't want to get too much into Ecclesiastes because we will. And I think it'll be an interesting study. And uh, hopefully it'll be beneficial to us all. So uh, you've got all this laid out here in 1 Kings chapter 1. David's, again, he's about to die. Somebody's going to assume the throne. You go back to, Sam, uh, to uh, Nathan's prophecy in 2 Samuel chapter uh, 7. And that's all tied into Solomon and the promises that are given to Solomon. But Adonijah uh, assumes the throne, if you will. He presumes to be the king. And I want you to notice here, when Adonijah takes this presumption, look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 9. It says, uh, And Adonijah slew sheep and oxen and fat cattle by the stone of Zoeleth, which is by Enrogel, and called all his brethren and the king's sons, David's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants, but, notice who he leaves out, Nathan. Of course, that's David. That's the guy who's been by David's side as prophet the whole time. Benaiah and the mighty men, these are the guys who were kind of like David's, I guess you'd almost say like today, the secret service. And Solomon, his brother, he called not. So that, that kind of shows you his motivation uh, for not calling those guys. He's going to presume the throne, but yet he's not the one who's supposed to be the king. Um, you can also read all about this in First, king, uh, First Chronicles chapter 22. The, to me, too, now that shows... So when we think of David... What's the one phrase in the Bible a lot of times that people, when they think of David, that they think of when God chose him to be king? Anybody? A man after God's own heart. That was prior. That was, that was in the days when Saul was still alive. And Saul was abusing his uh, authority as king and things like this. David was a humble man. He had a humble beginning. Um... But then you see, his, you see his departure from God's ways. Again, you look at... A, a, David had a minimum of eight wives that we have revealed in Scripture. And a multitude of children. He reigned for 40 years. And uh, throughout his life you see the revolts, particularly of Absalom, his own son. David's family life was not what it ought to have been. And it wasn't certainly not... It certainly was not what it could have been, but uh, he, uh, he obviously departed from God's ways. So let's, 
Let's do this and then we'll stop for tonight. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 17. We're not going to read all of this because it starts in verse 14 and goes to the end of the chapter. Deuteronomy 17. And it starts in verse 14. First of all, verse 15, don't set a king over you who is not from among your people. All right, so no Gentile kings. Don't multiply horses, verse 16. You realize that archaeology has found Solomon's horse stables. And I forget how many thousands of stables he had for horses that he went down to Egypt and got. So, you have that. Um... Verse 17, neither shall he multiply wives to himself. Again, and, you know, we always, think as, we always think of Solomon as the standard of that one. But his own father had at least eight. So David didn't do what God said. That his heart may not turn away, verse 17 says. Well, you read 1 Kings chapter 11, it says Solomon loved. And it's kind of amusing how the King James reads here. It says Solomon loved many strange women. Well, I've known some strange women too, but the word there means foreign. <laughs> Solomon loved many foreign women, and he, and he married foreign women and for the sole purpose of making treaties with other nations. And that God said, don't do that. Um, verse 17, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Solomon got so much gold that silver was like stones in the land of Israel, the Bible says. So we talk about the golden age of Israel in the days of Solomon, but really, that's all we're talking about is the gold. And the, the, Solomon was relative, had relative peace throughout his 40 years. Now, towards the end, things got a little difficult with some enemies. But for most of his 40 years, he had a time of peace. But so far as I can tell, most all of Solomon's life was in rebellion to God. And it was all in pursuit, it was all in his own pursuit of finding what we would say today, happiness, completion, whatever. And it didn't work. So uh, what we'll do when we come back next week, we will come to 1 Kings. We, we've covered chapters 1 and 2 pretty much. Um, we'll start in 1 Kings chapter 3 next Sunday night, Lord willing. And uh, of course... As always, on Sunday nights, if you have questions, we'll deal with those first from the Sunday morning sermon. And then we'll plan on starting in 1 Kings chapter 3 uh, next Sunday night, alright? Well, when you think of uh, what I was talking about earlier, when you think of David's advice to his son Solomon, you can't get any better than what David gave him there in 1 Kings 2 verses 1 through 4. Follow God, keep His commandments his judgments, his statutes, um, that he may be with you. Well, that's God's blessings to be upon us from the beginning, from the time of Adam and Eve until us today, until the Lord comes back, are always conditional. And it was no different with the kings of the nation of Israel. In fact, if you kept reading there in Deuteronomy 17, on down through verse 20, it talks about the, the kings, one of the requirements of a king was that he have a copy of the book of the law, and he was to read it every day. Well, that's good advice for us. You and I are reigning with Christ in the kingdom right now. And we need to be reading His book, His documents, every day and living accordingly. And we need to follow the advice that David gave to Solomon that Solomon didn't follow. So it may be that there's someone here tonight who is... Maybe you've studied and been thinking about becoming a Christian and maybe you're ready to make that... Take that step. We're here to help you tonight. Maybe you have questions about it. We'll be happy to talk to you. Maybe here tonight you've not been faithful to God. Um, you, see the, you see the results in the life of David, in the life of Solomon, and a lot of the tragedies that they faced because they didn't do what God required. Well, if, if there's something in your life here tonight as a child of God that's standing in between you and the hope of heaven, let's get rid of it tonight. There's nothing, there's nothing that, t that can take place of your relationship with God. There's nothing that can satisfy you. There's nothing that can make you happy or, or give you a sense of 
fullness in life if you're not fulfilling your God-given purpose. And that's to glorify Him. So if you need to respond to the gospel tonight, either by obeying it initially or being restored, let's do it right now as we stand and sing.